rather than focus only on the lectionary, I thought a deep dive into some of these biblical personalities might be an adventure in connecting their stories with our stories or saying, no, that's not my story. <laughs> so um, Joe's starting it off with Eve, uh, the mother of, of all of us at some level. And then I'm going to follow that with Hagar, the mother of the Arab nations. And I am indebted to Patricia Bays for the Hagar poems, which I didn't know about. So we'll talk about that um, more next week. And then Joe goes on to Mary. And I'm doing a quirky little thing about the Hebrew women write a letter to St. Paul. Um, so I think, <laughs> I think we'll have some fun and I think it'll also um, be a deep dive. And so welcome to George and Patricia is, but these are both friends from um, Ottawa. So we're glad to have an international flavor to, to our time together. I'm looking forward to that. So um, take it away, Joe. Okay, great. Well, welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, as Linda said, uh, we both share this love of poetry. I wish I was more expert on poetry than I am, but I love it. And I don't know that. So I enjoy, I've enjoyed preparing this and I hope that that will come through uh, as we talk about this. So I have a lot of stuff, I think. Um, <laughs> And so I'm going to I'm going to do this on a PowerPoint, um, which, you know, is not so great. But um, let's see. Yeah, okay. Yay, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Right. OK. So our first and, and by the way, if you have a question or a comment, uh, mostly, I hope it's going to be comments rather than questions, but you know, either one. <laughs> um, but please feel free to either raise your hand. You know how to do that on Zoom, probably. And if not, well, you can just actually raise your hand or just say something. I mean, that would be fine. So tonight we're going to be talking about Eve, the mother of, of us all. Um, and so the first thing that I wanted is to see what you think. What do you think of when you think of Eve? I will tell you, I grew up Baptist, and so I'm, you know, uh, a Southern Baptist of that, and so um, I have some very specific, well, this is what the Bible says about Eve, and so that's what it must have been, um, and 70-something years later, well, here we are, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think of when you think of Eve? This wasn't supposed to be that hard a question. <laughs> I think of it as a creation story. It's a, it's a how do you get started story and okay. a launch story. Great. Thanks. Michael, did you have your hand up? Actually, I was just trying to get the lights to turn back on, but I okay. did. <laughs> one thought did occur when you say, what do you think of when you think of Eve? And one thing I think of is temptation. Okay. We'll talk about that. Any others? Well, I think it's a story. I don't uh, think Eve was an actual person, but I think uh, as Susan said, I think it's a, an origin story right. about where we all come from and what characteristics are found in humanity. Right, yep, thanks. Nancy, you? Yes. Oops, I'm trying to get my. Uh, I well, I do think of it as as a creation story, as an origin story. Um, but I admit, I also think of Eve uh, as coming out of the Rift Valley in Ethiopia. <laughs> oh, <laughs> having uh, you know, it's just my anth anthropology background. <laughs> and I still, I have you know, I have a wonderful vision of uh, uh, of Eve uh, coming, rising out of the Rift Valley. So, 
Well, I will tell you right now that I have not found any poems that uh, that address that topic or that issue, but, uh, but I'm sure there probably are some. So thank you for that. That's a, that's awesome. Thank you. Any others? So you're going to talk about her as a source of sin, right? Well, there are some who, <laughs> who consider that to be the case. The source well, let's, of let's, sin. Let's, just talk into, let's talk about this. And there are, um, so there are, as you probably know, there are any number, that, well, there are basically five Bible references to Eve. Um, there are, I say five basic ones. There is the what I'm going to call the Genesis 1 creation story. And just to re refresh your recollection of that, um, this is from the NRSV. Uh, and so this is on the sixth day. So God created, so I'm say, sorry, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over every wild the animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God saw that everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, not just good, very good. That's Genesis 1. Genesis 2, and uh, I know you're going to pay close attention because I'm going to ask you what you see as differences, if indeed there are any differences for you. Uh, you could look at this as a second creation story, or you could look at it as simply an explanation of the first creation story. I'll uh, get your thoughts about that. So, so, ge so in, from Genesis 2, um, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And it goes on for a little bit. And then, and then the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. But for in the day, in that day that you eat of it, you shall die. Then it goes on uh, that God saw that, uh, that, that the man did not have a partner. And so he says, um, for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called a woman or out of man. This one was taken. And then we get the verse, well, therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. We're going to stop there, and I wanted to see if you have any comments about what you see. How do you see these two, these creation stories? Do you see them as one or as two? Uh, which one, if you see them as two, which one is more appealing? Which one... Which differences do you see? So, any thoughts about that? Well, I will tell you that <laughs> um, in the reading that I've done, I have seen um, some writers suggest that there is only one creation story, and in Genesis 2, uh, that is simply an explanation of what happened on the sixth day in Genesis 1. I've seen other writers who say, 
what? These are two different stories. I mean, the details are different um, and, and, and the details get different in this discussion. For example, um, in Genesis 1, we hear that God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. In Genesis 2, we hear that God created the man from the dust of the ground, breathed life into his nostrils and breath of life, and the man became a living being in the image of God. Whereas the woman was made from the man's rib, and there's nothing that specifically says, and she was created in the image of God. Um, Adam liked her. Um, he thought she was great. And we're gonna we're gonna see that theme repeated in some of the poems that we're gonna look at. Um, so any any thoughts about that, about all of that? If she came from Adam, Adam's rib and he was in the image of God, then clearly his rib was part of the image of God. Okay. So I certainly wouldn't support the idea that Adam was image of God and Eve was not. Whoa. Okay, that's good. <laughs> As you probably know, there are differences of opinion, but you know, but that's, I guess that's what makes the world go around. So, but, but thank you for that, yes. Any others? Well, let's move on then, because when we talk about the image of God, I think it was Michael that said he thinks of temptation. Um, and, and so here is Genesis 3, or at least in part. It starts out in verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Now he goes on. The, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. And it goes on with some curses uh, and some prescriptions for what's gonna happen as a consequence of this, uh, of this, of this whole thing. And then chapter three ends up, the man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. And then the Lord God said, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live 
forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Thus endeth chapter 3. Any thoughts about chapter 3, as you've heard it read? It certainly seems as if um, Eve was the protagonist here. Well, other than the snake, um, she was the human act agency in um, <clears throat> disobedience. And that, that gets picked up in the church's teachings over the years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, one of, one of the things that kind of strikes me is that what God had told Adam was don't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden because um, it's because you're not supposed to do that. You're not going to do that because the, because that's where you'll learn about good and evil. But then he throws them out of the garden or, or it drives them out of the garden because well, if they now know about good and evil, maybe they'll find the other tree, the tree of life, and then they'll become immortal, um, like him. So I'm just wondering why didn't? Well, anyway, that, I just wondered why didn't why didn't say that about the about the tree of life in the first place. So, but that's a but that's a that's just a minor point. Well, let me share with you just two other passages from the New Testament to give you an idea of how it is that perhaps the church has come to see this story. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Paul says, I wish you would bear with me a little in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. I feel a, design, a divine jealousy for you, for I promised you in marriage to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by its cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Period. And then in 1 Timothy, in the second chapter, this is as part of the, uh, the prescription where the writer, uh, presumably Paul, but you know, whoever the writer is of 1 Timothy, says, I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument, also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. And then it goes on, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. That's 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15. Or eight to fourteen, actually. So, since those passages are certainly read in church, I mean, those are some of the things that we hear as prescriptions for, for the proper way that um, men and women should conduct themselves, particularly women. And there is the attribution that women should act in certain ways uh, because they don't want to become Eve's. They don't want, be, and they're subject to being that because they're women. So I'm just telling you what Paul said or what, what these guys said. So any thoughts about any of that? Those, that's, that ends the scripture passages about Eve. Now there are other references, um, you know, but those are, are pretty good. Those are the ones that name Eve by name um, and, um, and refer to her in this specific story. 
Any any thoughts? Joe, this is Diane. Oh, um, yeah. One of the things I was thinking about, oh, I was muted, thank goodness, um, uh, at the first Timothy um, reading, because I went, oh my, um, at the end of that one. Um, and then that my um, when you read 2 Corinthians, I, I should go run and get a Bible, but I wasn't, does it, I'm sure it's to the church in Corinth, but does he, is there anyone in particular he's speaking to at that point? Um, no, this is, this is in chapter 11. So he's talking, as far as we know, just to the church. It's, it's the, to the general church in Corinth. General church. Okay. And then lastly, I spent um, some time in Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting down with one of the correspondents from uh, the Saudi newspaper, and I asked him why the women wore the abaya and were uh, fully, um, you couldn't see much of them. Sometimes you could see some of their face and some of them, you know, wore, had veils as well. And he said that the reason that they dressed that way was that during, I believe, the Ottoman Empire, when the Turks came down and into the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, they took all the beautiful women and left the ugly women. So what they did was that they made all the women wear the abaya. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. I, I did not say much, I just listened. But um, So that's what the, about the clothing. I was like, oh. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments, thoughts? One of the things that this was an echo was, um, for me, was against the ordination of women. Um, now, really, the arguments were about the nature of God, the nature of the church, and the nature of discipleship. But um, there are some lingering things about, in the US especially, about how long it took for women's authority to be welcomed because it, it just seemed as if women were always suspect at some level, suspect. Mm -hmm. Not trustworthy to handle the knowledge of good and evil, I guess. So I, uh, I mentored an EFM group for four or five years. And at the end of uh, one particular group of students, a man said to me, well, he said, it's all been fine. But he said, I really believe that the Bible says women ought not to teach men. And I thought, oh, fine, four years. <laughs> I did what I could. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure you did. And being an EFM person my, or a mentor myself, and several of us are and have been an EFM or are an EFM, you you wonder how someone can go through four years of EFM and come up with yes. that kind of comment. But you know, I guess it takes all kinds. So whatever. he was relatively untouched by it. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> you do what you can. You do what you can. Well, and one of you, I know, said that, you know, that this was, that the, the stories about Eve, when you think of Eve, you think of an origin story. Well, the origins can be, take many forms, and the origins can be, what are the origins of men's understanding of their relationship to women? Or, as Linda just said, what the origin of, you know, the church's a teaching on who can be a priest, or what should, how should the church be structured, or, you know, why do we have what are these women doing there in the first place? I mean, that kind of thing. So, um, so I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of that. Um, the, uh, the icon to the right is an icon, as you can imagine, uh, or as you can see, of the, the formation of Eve from Adam's rib. Um, we're going to see a couple more of those in just a little bit. Um, so, Let's move on. Oh, Joe, I yes. just wanted to add, say one thing. Uh -huh. my, my sense in, with uh, some of the, the 
letters of Paul is that he was speaking to a particular issue in that particular church, one that maybe could or shouldn't be generalized to everywhere. And that a lot of it was due to the culture, uh, the culture and the role of women as, as, it, as it was at that time or how it was seen in that, in that culture. But I, um, that's just, I throw that out there for. Yeah, and I don't disagree at all with that. And I think that's exactly the point that Paul wasn't able to rise above that because for him, you know, the teaching was, well, uh, I'm afraid that, you know, in whatever the situation is, you know, the women are going to be, this, you know, we're go you're going to be in a situation where you might be like Eve, and if that's the case, you might be deceived by, you know, by the cunning of the serpent or the cunning, cunning of the devil, um, you know, that, that kind of thing, but, but I agree with you, I think that's exactly right, and by the way, one of the things you'll notice, of course, one of the, you know, there's several traditional uh, things that we hear about in the story of Eve, one of them is, is that she was tempted by the devil, well, that may be, um, but that's not what the text says, and the second thing is, is that, well, you know, she was, that there was, the, or the, the fruit that, were, that she was dealing with was an apple. And again, the text does not mention that. Um, so a lot of the, you know, a lot of things that we, we come to believe are our traditions, you know, may not be textually, you know, uh, required or even contemplated, so. So let's move to the first of the, the pieces of art. And there are, there are a lot, as you can imagine, there are a lot of wonderful pieces of art. Um, and this is just, a, um, just a, a, a sample of this. The first one is from the Sistine Chapel. Um, this is the panel, um, Michelangelo's The Original Sin, um, which is an Augustinian concept rather than a biblical concept necessarily, but anyway, uh, and the expulsion from paradise. And so Michelangelo puts these two together. Um, you probably, I don't know if you can see my little uh, paltry little fuchsia, um, I think that's the color, um, little pointer, but um, in the first, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, Eve, is uh, with Adam, uh, looking discreetly away from his um, from his center, um, and be, is being tempted by the serpent. And one of the things to note is the serpent herself. I stress herself because the serpent is um, a female, um, and so that's that's one thing you can see the um, you can see the serpent here um, as a female. Um, you'll also notice that the, uh, for what it's worth, that there are no apple trees here. This is a fig tree. Uh, even I know, well, I mean, I had figs when I was growing up, and this, these are definitely fig leaves. Um, another thing to note is that I, I wonder if you'll notice that both Adam and Eve are together at this, uh, at this um, you know, tree. And I wonder if you can see the expressions of Adam and of Eve, and if you have any comment about what the artist, what Michelangelo might have thought was really going on here. Um, the Sistine Chapel's comments, for, for what they're worth, not that they're gospel, but, you know, but it's there, <laughs> it's at the Sistine Chapel. So the Vatican Museum, I guess, their comments basically are to the effect, well, you know, you can't really see Adam, but he's the one that's really trying to uh, protect Eve, if you will. Uh, you can even see him, this is kind of a, uh, it's, it's almost a play on the creation of Adam because Adam's arm is extended, but he's not reaching his finger out and the serpent is definitely reaching past Adam uh, to, you know, to get to Eve. The other thing that the Vatican Museum notes is, is that it's Adam that's reaching for the fig, not Eve. 
Eve's perfectly happy. She seems to be very carefree about the whole thing. She's not concerned in the least, but um, still, uh, you know, you the, the, these are the comments that the, that the museum says. Um, this just shows that Michelangelo was way ahead of his time with Adam grabbing the fruit. There you go. There you go. But, you know, but th again, it's an artistic impression, but it's interesting, you know, uh, you know, that he would have come to this. I mean, he was painting this under the auspices of the Pope, um, whom you'd think would have to have some, you know, either he wasn't paying much attention or he was okay with all this. So I don't know. Now, unfortunately, I was trying to get the pictures so that they would all be kind of jammed up onto the left side of the screen because I knew there was a gallery view. But if you look at the right hand side of the screen, you may not be able to see it. You'll see that the angel with her sword, with the sword is uh, keeping Adam and Eve or pushing Adam and Eve out of the garden. Um, and if you, the, 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 the artist comments basically are that this is a story as far as they are concerned about Eve. It's not so much about Adam, it's about Eve because she's the principal figure in the story. I mean, all of the, all of the lines draw your attention to Eve. They all point to Eve. I mean, all of these things, oops, sorry about that. Um, so all of them point to Eve. So let's move on to the next one. This one is by... Can I, can I ask, ask why in the sequence of events in the garden, did they not become naked after they tasted the fruit? No, well, or were they that, naked to begin with? I know they made things out of fig leaves and all that, but well, the text I, says the Genesis version is before they had the the temptation and the fall, they were naked, and it and the and the Bible even says they were naked and were not ashamed. Um, but as soon as they tasted the fruit of the of good and evil, they became aware of good and evil. And it's at that point that they uh, stitch together some clothes of fig leaves. Um, and then God, after he's getting ready to, you know, throw them out of the garden, um, stitches something more permanent for them. So that's kind of the sequence of the clothing. I'm sure we could do a whole fashion industry thing here. But <laughs> so anyway, but thank you for the, thank you for that. So the no. next one, yes, uh-huh. Real quick, one of the things I thought was interesting is the Eve on the right looks much less attractive to me than she does on the left. Yeah. And, and I was wondering if that was on purpose, but. Well, um, I would suspect she knows she's been caught. Um, she's been ashamed. She hid from God and God found her anyway. And she got thrown out of the garden. And now she's stuck with this guy um and um they're gonna have to make the best of it and she's been told she's gonna have to have children and it's gonna hurt a lot um and she better watch out for snakes because you know they're not friends anymore um so yeah i can understand why she would be a little a little down downcast but i think that's what it is i i'm very curious about why the serpent you know finishes up having a human form I mean, I didn't see that initially. I just thought that was, I don't know what I thought that was, but I, it never occurred to me to connect the figure in the middle of the picture with mm -hmm. the um, and, you, and you pointing out that it looks like it's a female figure as opposed to a male, but nevertheless, I mean, you have to use your imagination to connect that bodily image with the serpent at least I, I find it difficult i wouldn't immediately have thought that okay thanks well and we're going to see it, it, this is not the only piece of art that makes that connection um and uh you'll we'll talk a little bit about paradise lost not a lot because all, almost all of paradise lost deals with this whole uh this whole uh, issue um but for Paradise Lost, the serpent it, or the, the devil is the tempter and the devil is more in the form of an angel, but the angels can take the form of humans, uh, of people. 
And so I'm not sure if Michelangelo was saying, well, this is it, but it's clearly female. Um, at least I'm pretty sure that is. So uh, anyways, so let's look just real quickly at the next one. This is from the grandson of Peter Bruegel. Um, this is Jan Bruegel the Younger. And so if you know the Bruegels, you know that they like to paint uh, amazing landscapes, amazing uh, pictures where the main thing that's going on in the picture is kind of back in the background. Um, and so here you get a landscape with um, the creation of Eve. And so you have wonderful trees, you have, um, you know, you see that Eve is coming out of Ad Adam, who's been put to sleep. Um, and God is pulling Eve out of there, out of Adam and forming her into the woman. And all around are these wonderful uh, flowers, all of these uh, animals that were in the garden. Um, so this is a, a typical broil. I mean, if I could put it that way. Um, if you, if we wanted to, we could probably look at the symbology of each one of these types of flowers and trees uh, and animals that are in this to make a, a further connection, a further, you know, more complex, uh, you know, story. Um, but I'm going to leave it at this because there are other things that I want that we need to go on to or that we will go on to. Any thoughts about this painting? This is from 130 years later after Michelangelo. Then about 150 years later, we get William Blake, um, English uh, uh, artist, poet, uh, hymn writer, all, all of those things. And this is uh, a painting um, I believe it's in the, it's in, the, yeah, it's in the Metropolitan Museum of, uh, in New York City. And this is the angel of the divine presence bringing Eve to Adam, paren, the creation of Eve, and she shall be called a woman. And you'll see that this story is rather different than anything we've seen so far. Um, here, Eve is coming down off of blue tinged clouds. She's going to Adam who is recumbent. If he, if he had given up a rib in order to, for her to be made, well, that's not the part that's being emphasized by the artist. Um, and here the angel of the divine presence is the one who's connecting these two. You can see that Adam, I would say looks pretty eager uh, to make Eve's acquaintance. Um, and Eve is okay with this as well. Uh, this is before, obviously, they've, uh, you know, um, you know, found the, the tree of uh, good and evil. Um, and so you see uh, this, Blake um, considered the Bible to be the supreme poetic work, and he reimagines the creation of Eve in this way. Um, so a couple of things to note. One, I don't know if you can see this, but there are a couple of birds over here. There's blue and red birds. There's another one right down here. And the birds are, uh, they represent newly created souls, according to uh, Blake's symbology. You'll see here uh, a grapevine and grape uh, grapes and uh, grape leaves uh, tend to uh, refer to uh, marriage and weddings, um, as far as Blake is concerned. Right down here, and this is very hard to see, but I think if you look at it, you'll see that there is a lion, a lion's head. The lion is asleep, and there are three lambs right over here. And so here you get the reference to the lion and the lambs lying down together. And that in the pre-fall time, um, there, there was simply a time of peace, um, peace and harmony and everybody loved each other and everybody got along with everybody and that was, it was great. 
Um, so there are all these little details uh, in here, but the oak leaf, there's a giant oak leaf that uh, Adam is lying on. And the oak leaf uh, is symb or symbolic, sim symbolizing suffering uh, and pain, which is getting ready to come. But that's the, the story that's being told by William Blake out of the Adam and Eve story. It's interesting that the sky is dark over Adam, but brightening over Eve and the, the coming of light in a way. Uh, great point. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts? It made me think about <clears throat> the wedding liturgies. <clears throat> what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Mm -hmm. Even this uh, mystical moment of uh, joining, I guess. Right. right. Yeah. Thanks. Well, let's look on. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, as I say, Paradise Lost um, uh, is, well, uh, a very famous poem, uh, one of the masterworks of English uh, literature, um, written by John Milton in the 1650s, 1650, 1660. Um, one of the things that I would, one of the books that I ran across, and you probably can't read that or see this, but this is a book called uh, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, and it's by Stephen Greenblatt. Uh, and uh, yeah, Rowan Williams, if that makes any difference, thinks this is a richly learned, live, lively book. But it's a great book because Paradise, this is a, a time when Paradise Lost was written when Milton basically um, had gone blind uh, and couldn't, couldn't read what he wrote. But so he developed some wonderful facility to memorize and dictate uh, all, these, all this poetry, uh, you know, for you know, um, you know, just, uh, it's amazing. Um, he also had some interesting issues with marriage, uh, with his own marriage. And this was at a time during the English Civil War where he was uh, one of the royalists. And uh, for a while, you know, things looked bad because uh, Oliver Cromwell, who was not one of the royalists, uh, you know, was in charge. And Milton uh, was in jeopardy of losing his life. Uh, but uh, but when Charles II, you know, was re or you know brought back to be king, John Milton came on. By then, he was pretty well blind. But it's at that point that he, uh, you know, writes Paradise Lost. Some of the engravings that are done. There's a whole series of engravings at different points in time, and this one is from an 1827 series for Paradise Lost, and you get a different notion here of. Eve and the temptation, and you see the serpent here. We don't see Adam anywhere. Um, so obviously there are different ways that different artists can conceive of, you know, what happened uh, at this time. Hmm. Yes, would it, any comment? Yes. Okay. Okay, I wanna share with you a few poems. Um, the first one is this one, When God Dreamed Eve Through Adam by Richard Chess. I, I did not know Richard Chess. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm envious of uh, Linda because Linda has a correspondence with Ted Kuzer, um, you know, wonderful Canadian poet. And uh, as it happens, I've discovered that Richard Chess is the head of the English department and the head of the Jewish studies department at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. So he lives down the road from me uh, when I'm there, and I'm gonna write him a letter and you know tell him that I love this poem, which I kind of do, and uh, well we'll see if he writes me back. I don't know. So I'm like I said, you're you're setting an example for me, Linda. Um, this uh, poem would it, would any would any would any of you uh, be willing to read this for us? People are surely tired of hearing my voice. <laughs> Don't be shy.
I'll be happy to be part of it. Thank you. When Adam saw her muscle, excuse me, when Adam saw her muscle of a new day, when he squatted to smell the musk between her legs, when he leaned down to grasp the wrist of the most familiar creature he'd encountered yet, to pull himself, the mirror, mirror image of himself, to her feet. When he took a few steps back to appraise her with the mind of sun, the heart of moon, to praise her. With the applause of leaves disturbed to seduce her with the iridescence of lizard skin, to navigate into the current of her and be powered and transported like a fish through a diaphanous river shadow and light, to know her with every cell, every molecule, all the atoms and elements that spun into his inception with all creation pulsing in his temples, his wrist, with his unique talent endowed in him by his creator to see beyond the moment's garden all the way into the geneticist's lab. When he stood back from her, suddenly he understood the world would never culminate nor close with him. And he was frightened, the first, the original terror which he couldn't tell from wonder as he stood there regarding what was made of the same stuff as he, yet utterly strange. How the world around him even then was tossing up difference after difference until maybe even they'd be tossed aside should this new allowance for difference not grow the way God dreamed it would. When God dreamed Eve through Adam into being. Hmm. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't like about this poem, but um, but do you have any any thoughts, any questions or comments about about this? It's so physical. I really, although I was stunned by that a little bit, um, that first stanza about squatting to smell the musk between her legs. You know, I'm like, oh. This is a poem. <laughs> it's um, and the fact that um, the mirror that he sees in the beginning is not where he ends. And I really like that because I think that that <clears throat> that's kind of my approach to scripture. You know, the mirror is not going to end. It's not going to be a mirror by the time you get done looking right. and, and discovering. So it's like, um, yeah, I like it. I like it. Right. Any other thoughts? Interesting, though, Adam is the subject of the sentence. And then it goes on in the fourth uh, stanza or whatever uh, to seduce her with the iridescence of lizard skin. So is Adam the serpent? Mm. Well, that could be. That could be. Yes. Yeah. And remember, this is um, this poem is written by uh, a man who is very who is Jewish. I'll just just leave it at that. So, um, well, if you go back to Michelangelo's uh, painting, Adam was grabbing the fruit. Yeah, that's right. That is right. Um, and it was Adam who knew what the tree was. Theoretically, Eve did not know that unless Adam and Eve, you know, had conversations about stuff like this, you know, in their uh, uh, intimate moments. But I mean, you know, there's nothing that says that Eve had got the same command to not eat of the fruit of the, fruit of, of the tree of good and evil. So at least not in Genesis. Mm. You know, one of the things to note is and it's hard to remember and I think it relates back to that very first uh, paragraph that Linda was somewhat taken taken with uh, taken aback by and you know both Adam and Eve had no past they had no background they just came out of whole cloth I mean they didn't they they didn't they didn't learn things they just were at least that's what the story seems to say. And so it would seem perfectly normal for him to kind of do some exploring and say, what in, what is it? What in the world is this? Yeah, Nancy? 
you're muted. Nancy, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Am I unmuted now? Okay. You're good. I said I was really struck by this uh, stanza, and he was frightened. The first, the original terror, which he couldn't tell from wonder as he stood there regarding what was made. So these are pretty, you know, intense uh, feelings. Fright, terror, uh, wonder. Um, that, that really... Um, uh, struck me sees yeah yep i agree i mean this was a whole a whole new experience there was no precedent whatever for eve none and adam you know basically is saying i thought i was it i thought i was all there was and now i see that not only do i see it but i can even perceive that this is not, I am not the be all and end all of this. Mm -hmm. And I love the, the idea that God dreamed Eve through Adam into being. Well, I guess it's poetic license, but um, when you're thinking of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, when you look at the first, I guess, stanzas, uh, as Patricia said on the right hand side, um, the geneticist lab. I mean, what did they know about genetics back in, in those days? <laughs> Other than there was male and female and there was some lure between the two, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's very, um, in many ways, it, it, it reminds me of th what things might be like in the garden, but it also reaches out into the, uh, the present, you know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I was thinking that that whole tossing up difference after difference yes he says men are from mars and women from venus and we still are this is a continuum what adam experienced both men and women still experience of each other and that that experience is what defines i guess our humanity as we explore it so absolutely that uh, thank you for that comment um, that is one of that's one of my favorite parts of this poem as well. Um, I just think the like I said, I'm gonna have to read more of this more, more of this poet uh, and want to get see what I can find out about him. Well, let me. Our, our time is getting very uh, very short, and I apologize. So let me just run through a few other things. Uh, Michael will probably I don't know if you'll put these PowerPoint things on. Um, you know, the, you know, available for people to look at if you want to look at them, but you, you don't have to listen to me anymore. You get to look at some poems and some artwork. Um, and so uh, you'll note here the uh, painting of, by Peter Ball Rubens, again, from the 1620s of Adam and Eve. Uh, here, you'll note that the serpent um, doesn't look very serpent-like. Um, uh, and Adam and Eve have completely different postures than they did in the Michelangelo uh, painting. The next one is much more contemporary. Uh, Joe. The modern piece by Max Beckmann, a German expressionist. Um, this is in a museum in Berlin. Um, and this is during the time of World War I. So there are a lot of things that are going on in the art world and in the world of culture. Um, but uh, things are quite different. One of the things that I will just point out to you just for what, it, for what they're worth um, is that the only colors or the only basic color that you see in these pa this painting is the yellow lily and the red eye of the serpent. And uh, the, the notes that the museum put out are that the red eyes of the serpent allude to the mercurial nature of the devil. The yellow lily um, alludes to purity and redemption. And basically the apple isn't an apple, it's Eve's breast. Um, that's the temptation. That's what represents the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and you can take it for what it's worth. But the artist, at least, can be read as an allegory warning against the temptation of 
a reprise of the violence, cruelty, and destruction that plagued Germany during World well, plagued the war during World War One. Um, so that's another example. You may find it very meaningful. You may find it less helpful uh, than others. The the other poems, and I'll just mention them to you just very quickly because I know our time's about up. This poem is by a woman. Uh, her painting or her art, her herself, I mean, her painting is here. She is uh, English and this was 1611. And this, you can get a, a pretty good idea of this when it says, but surely Adam cannot be excused. Her fault, though great, yet he was most to blame. What weakness offered, strength might have refused. So playing on the notion that Adam was supposed to be the, the more strong of the two. Um, and so don't blame Eve. Um, she also makes the notion that if Eve did err, it was for knowledge sake. And that theme is gonna be repeated in a couple of the other poems that are gonna be, uh, that we're gonna be talking about. But this poem is a, a wonderful poem by a woman poet from 1611. So this is pretty unusual. Rita Dove, who was the poet laureate of the United States uh, in the early to mid 1990s, uh, wrote this poem. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get it far enough over on the right-hand side of the, uh, the page, or the left-hand side of the page. Um, but this one, well, let me, I'll just read it to you real quick and let you think about it. It wasn't bliss. What was bliss but the ordinary life? She'd spend hours in patter, moving through whole days, touching, sniffing, tasting, exquisite housekeeping in a charmed world. And yet there was always more of the same. All that happiness, the aimless being there. So, she wandered for a while, lingered to look through a pond's restive mirror. He was off cataloging the universe, probably, pretending he could organize what was clearly someone else's chaos. That's when she found the tree, the dark crabbed branches bearing up such speechless bounty. She knew without being told this was forbidden. It wasn't a question of ownership. Who could lay claim to such maddening perfection? And there was no voice in her head, no whispered intelligence lurking in the leaves, just an ache that grew until she knew she'd already lost everything except desire, the red heft of it warming her outstretched palm. Wow. So um, I offer that one to you, uh, no serpent, um, just a voice in her head. Um, and so if we had time, I would love to hear more <clears throat> from you about how you, could, how you might consider yourself or see yourself as children of Eve, how we all are children of Eve, where what we have left is not innocence, but desire. Um, and so what are your desires? Um, so I think Rita Dove has lots of wonderful things to say about that. And then the very last poem, well, actually, I'm, I'm, I won't read these. I'm just gonna just point out that there's a poem by Toni Morrison. Uh, she was primarily a fiction writer, as you know, but she wrote a book of five poems and this is one of them. So, so it's good. And it's uh, very quotable and very notable. I love this poem. And then, Joe, yes. Joe, um, yes. I don't think you need to rush um, through these last two poems um, because our slotted time goes to 8.30. Oh, to 8.30? Um, oh that's God. what I advertised in Ottawa. Oh. And so... I thought we were to 8. And I apologize otherwise. Yeah, would, so, would... so you can just, um, I don't... I'm not sure if that was clear in the website at St. John's. I hope so. Um, well, with uh, all respect to the wonderful people from St. John's who are here, if you've got things to do at eight, that's 
Well, he's going to do them, and but I'll be glad to stay till eight thirty. Okay. Time. So, okay. Yeah, that's not, thank okay. you, Linda. And Joe, okay. if I may interject just for a moment, um, yes. if anyone does wish a copy of the PowerPoint slides, if you will either in the public chat or in a private message to me, just type your email address and I'll be happy to send you those PowerPoint slides. Great, thank you, Michael. Or to me, if um, those of you from Ottawa don't know Michael, um, I'll just, just send me an email and I'll be glad to pass that along to him. Okay. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right. Well, I feel a little bit better because we can actually talk about a couple more things. That's wonderful. <laughs> so I've already blurted out what I thought, you know, some of the things I like about this poem about Read the Job, but I suspect you might have other things. So, Elizabeth, will you? I'm sorry. Any, any thoughts, any comments? I'm intrigued by the fact that she was bored <laughs> and that and this, uh, I can recognize that. Um, I think that reaching for curiosity or for something um, beyond the usual imagination is something I can identify with and I, I really like it. Um, putting it, so it, it's an interesting question that you pose about what do we desire? And um, <clears throat> part of the struggle of being here in Canada during this extended time period has been the sameness. Uh, so I identify with what um, the poet was saying that I have a desire to get the fruit from Florida <laughs> or some things are reaching out toward um, a new experience anyway. Yeah, Nancy? Yeah, I have the same, uh, same feeling as, as Linda. It's like, so what is she doing all day, day after day? It sounds, you know, the sameness. Um, she doesn't have purpose. He's cataloging, right? He's cataloging the universe <laughs> and she's just, wandering around with no purpose and i that really um um uh, resonated for me because i need purpose and i think we all need purpose so that that's anyway that's my contribution to that that's, right thank you patricia yeah uh, but i think uh, what was bliss but the ordinary life uh, one of the things the pandemic has brought home is that you have to find your bliss in the ordinary and every day. You know, we only have grocery stores and pharmacies open. We can't eat on patios, like there's nowhere to go. So we potter as she does, we're pottering around, um, but you have to find meaning and your satisfaction in the ordinary and the everyday rather than hankering about something that maybe isn't going to happen or maybe is going to happen later. I think contentment has been for me the biggest challenge and the biggest thing to achieve during this, whatever it is, 18 months or so. Right, thank you. But and at least for you, hopefully, you have the notion or the idea that this is gonna end. Eve had no, no basis for right. knowing that, so yeah. I just like the comment that she makes that Adam uh, was um, pretending he could organize. <laughs> that kind of caught me. <laughs> now, being a guy, of course, that's what we do. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and where was the woman, the organizer? Yes. Mm, that's right. And then what was clearly someone else's chaos. I, I don't know. That's interesting. Notion. Those roles should be reversed in the poem. <laughs> Indeed. Any, any other thoughts? I, I just, yes, I just love this poem. Any others? Well, then let's look at Toni Morrison's poem, um, which is again, a, a different take. And I wonder if I could impose on someone to, uh, to read this one for us. This one does make it all the way so you can see it on the screen. I will, if you'd like. 
Please. Okay. Eve remembering. I tore from a limb fruit that had lost its green. My hands were warm by the heat of an apple, fire red and humming. I bit sweet power to the core. How can I say what it was like? The taste. The taste undid my eyes and led me far from the garden planted for a child to wildernesses deeper than any master's call. Now these cool hands guide what they want to caress. Lips forget what they have kissed. My eyes now pull their light better the summit to see. I would do it all over again, be the harbor, and set the sail, lose the breeze and harness the gale, cherish the harvest of what I have been, better the summit to scale, better the summit to be. Thank you. Thank you. I would love to hear any comments that y'all have about this. Well, I think it's interesting the gardens planted the gardens planted for a child that in Eden was life was kind of immature that it depended on being loosed out of Eden in order for people to mature I'd never thought of that the garden of Eden planted for a child yep thank you yeah uh, It seems to me what she's saying <clears throat> uh, from my perspective is that um, what Eve did wasn't so bad because the taste of that apple, green apple or whatever color it was, was so good and it led her to other things deeper than the master's call, to wildernesses deeper than the master's call. So. I don't know whether she's saying it was an evil thing. That's what I'm trying to say, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, having put it that way, what do you, how does that make you feel? I mean, Patricia said, well, I hadn't thought about the Garden of Eden being a, such an, you know, an immature place. What, what do you think about what you've just said about um, maybe this wasn't a bad thing? Well, she says she'd do it all again because of the challenge, because of the change, and cherish the harvest of what I have been, better the summit to scale. Yeah. So that you moved out of immaturity, maybe through pain, maybe through hard work, maybe through things that you didn't expect, but the end is worth it. And Toni Morrison was a feminist. Strong feminist. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is a very, uh, a very affirming poem. Um, you know, she, she definitely sees Eve as being um, a strong mother uh, and a strong adventurer. You know, one of the things, well, one of the things that, you know, you wonder is we know, or, you know, our notion of God is that God knows what God is doing. Um, and yet one wonders, you know, by creating Adam and Eve and then telling them not to do this one thing, um, did God really think that was what we were going to do? Or did, or, or what? Um, in fact, there's some of the poets, I haven't put them quite in here, uh, but who have said that God smiled um, when uh, Eve exercised her freedom uh, and her uh, and gave uh, gave voice or will to her to her uh, desire uh, to know that Eve was curious and an adventurer and all of those very good kind of things. Um, and that's why this, she's the mother of all. Um, so 
so I don't know if you have any reaction to that, but um, but I think Eve remembering by Toni Morrison, you know, would certainly support that kind of an idea. This does not sound like a woman who was deceived. Right, right. No. Yeah. Right, a deliberate act. And one that, she, as they say, I would do this all over again. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Any others? I think Nancy has her hand up. She's muted. Nancy, was, was that a, a former hand or is that a real hand? A hand? Can I have a real hand? Nancy, yeah, you see your hand was up a former hand, um, ah. but I, since I'm unmuted, I would just say that, you know, I love everybody else's comments, and one line that, that struck me is that, or two, it's, and led me far from the gardens planted for a child to wildernesses deeper than any master's call, and that, I love that, that's yeah. just, again, as others have said, um, see um you know it's like an awakening uh so that that's all i have great thank you there's a challenge yeah. also <laughs> isn't there better the summit to be right right thank you yeah susan you were you gonna say something <laughs> I was. We started off saying that, um, or suggesting that this was a creation story, perhaps. And you have all the characters. And then what? You need action. This is, and this is wonderful to, to be the harbor, set the sail, loose the breeze and harness the gale. We're going exploring. We're to, no, it would be dumb. Even a parent knows that you don't tell a child, don't do this and plop them down in front of something perfectly lovely. No, that's, that's the beginning of the story. This is the launch. Thanks. Well, we have, I have two more poems and one more piece of art. So, uh, since Linda's told me that I still have, we have another 15 minutes or so, then we, we'll go through them. Uh, and I hope you'll enjoy these. They're a little bit different. Um, this one is by Mark Chagall. It's from 1961. Um, this is one of a series of paintings that he did, Adam and, Ex and Eve Expelled from Paradise. And I have to tell you, I, I can't tell, I don't know, I can't understand Chagall's symbolism. Um, but I love the colors. <laughs> and that's, that's a pretty weak explanation but, or comment, but, but there are all sorts of things that are going on here. I mean, we have uh, a flying blue horse. We have Adam and Eve escorted out or escorted out of the garden by a red, probably rooster. Well, I don't know if it's a rooster or not. But, and you got purple birds and, you know, all sorts of colors. Um, and this thing over here? Uh, I don't know. I would love for someone to explain it to me if you can, but, um, but I just love the colors. What's the name of it? I'm sorry, I can't see for the little boxes of pictures. Adam yeah. and Eve, what? Expelled oh, from Paradise. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Sure. And there's other people too, going the opposite way. There's somebody that, flowing down the river in the top left. Right, flowing down the river, and there's this person that's green, yeah. you know, down here. Somebody up top by the yellow horse. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I, this just makes me want to look at, at Chagall more because I just, I, I always <laughs> respond positively to his, his paintings, but I don't, I don't pretend to understand them. The only thing that I can say in my defense is, is that when I did try to read and, and get some kind of sense of what this is about, people say, people disagree about what this point, this painting is about and don't, don't exactly understand what the symbolism is. I think it's Chagall's private world. 
And so when we talk about uh, dreamers uh, in, the, in the Bible, maybe this will make more sense uh, because this is probably more of a dream uh, painting uh, than it is, well, anything that I can make sense of. So. Also, he, <clears throat> he comes, well, I, I have a big book on him, but it's in Jacksonville. So you can go over to the house and get it when you get back there. Um, I got it at that, what's that? That secondhand bookstore. Oh, Shamblin's. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got it. Shamblin's. I got a couple of them. Anyway, <clears throat> I think Chagall is in the, in the tradition of midrash. So that if if that opens things up for you a little bit, in that um, his his work is not. I mean, he has Jesus as a rabbi in a crucifixion painting, and um, he. He moves beyond the text. So maybe we could go back to thinking in terms of Tony Will Morrison's wildernesses, deeper wildernesses. And as Susan said, it's a launch into, right. um, into multiple dimensions of, of meaning. And I too feel that his work is not really... Um, easily interpreted literally I think it has much more to do with them um, kind of a mysticism that he he saw wonder all around him and figures were very seldom grounded actually they were always flying or um, I don't know he he has a way of um, his dimensionality I guess I would say is just really rich so that's helpful thank you that, that certainly helps me so thank you for that and well maybe i won't go over to your house but uh, maybe when you get back to jackson <laughs> if ever um, i'll give you the book it's huge it's that huge would, that would be great okay um, and that and that brings to mind one one thing about midrash uh and uh, one thing that I, one person that i haven't uh, spoken about is jan richardson um, Jan Richardson is a wonderful uh, painter and artist. Uh, she happens to live uh, near Jacksonville. Uh, she's a Methodist minister, but this particular, but she's also feminist, and she uh, has written this book um, for women. And one of the chapters is the beginning of all things, the book of Eve. And so, if you are looking for a book that's devotional in part uh, with lots of lovely prayers and blessings in part and lots of ideas uh, about the text i just highly recommend this i've had the privilege of meeting uh, jane and being led at a retreat by her and she's just absolutely wonderful but the other chapters in her book are about Brigid, uh, or bridget in, in ireland uh, the desert mothers hildegard of bingen uh, uh, and, uh, and a couple others. So, I highly recommend them. So, the last two poems one is by a young woman uh, named Ansel Elkin, and she's from uh, North Carolina. So, maybe I'll try to touch base with her as well. And if I can ask someone to uh, read this one for me, that would be great. Or, for, not for me, but for us. Uh, Joe, I'll read it. Thank you. Okay, uh, The Autobiography of Eve by Ansel Elkins. Wearing nothing but snakeskin boots, I blazed a footpath, the first radical road out of that old kingdom toward a new unknown. When I came to those great flaming gates of burning gold, I stood alone in terror at the threshold between paradise and earth. There I heard a mysterious echo, my own voice, singing to me from across the forbidden side. I shook awake, at once alive in a blaze of green fire. Let it be known I did not fall from grace. I leapt to freedom. Wow. <laughs> so a short poem. Um... 
I think the poet expresses her thoughts about Eve pretty well. Any thoughts? Well, it's like the other one where it was all positive. She would do it all again. Mm -hmm. So it's getting the feminist viewpoint in here that she wasn't all bad, all evil. Well, and I've then, never thought yeah. Eve was evil. No, no, I didn't either. But the, at the very beginning there, it, it seemed like she was, <laughs> like she was the root of all evil, sort of. Mm -hmm. But things have gotten better as we've gone along. <laughs> Well, and you know, there are various uh, stories uh, about this. I mean, there are people who have told the story in, a, in different ways and you get to choose, you know, or you get to decide, well, you know, um, this story may be what it was in the Bible, but this, you know, filling in the, the details or understanding what was really motivating the, the people, I can see how this, you know, is the case. Um, so I don't know, there are lots of different, takes on this. And I think that that's, uh, you, you may get the idea that uh, you may hear more different takes on scripture uh, as we go through our, uh, uh, the few weeks that we have together. So the last poem um, is by Robert Frost from 1942. Um, I'll just, and uh, uh, if there's anyone who'd like to read this, it's again, short. Um, I'd love to hear your voice. But in the interest of time, I guess I'll go ahead just real quickly. He would declare and could himself believe that the birds there and all the garden round from having heard the day long voice of Eve had added to their own an oversound her tone of meaning, but without the words. Admittedly, an eloquence so soft could only have had an influence on birds. When call or laughter carried it aloft, be that as it may, she was in their song. Moreover, her voice upon their voices crossed, had now per persisted in the woods so long that probably it never would be lost. Never again would bird song be the same. And to do that to birds was why she came. What a beautiful imagination that piece is. We're so familiar with, um, you know, the woods on a snowy evening, you know, uh, whatever. Um, this is just such a different take. I really appreciate um, all the poems that you've chosen, Joe. And this is um, to end with another male's voice that sees Eve's voice itself as um, a legacy that will forever persist in creation is just really beautiful. So thank you for that. And I think the pandemic has caused us all to notice the birds much more. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, that's nice to think of hearing the voice of Eve, like the voice of humanity, um, an oversound or echoing or resonating somehow in their cries. Yeah, I like that. Since, I've since I became familiar with this poem, um, I've done exactly that, Patricia. I, I, I love to hear the poems. I walk or the birds. And mm -hmm. when I walk the dog, our dog in the morning, uh, the birds are very noticeable. And, um, and I just you know, love to think about that. So thank you. Yes. Well, you know, it's now it is about time for us to, you know, to to wrap it up. Uh, it's about eight thirty. Um, there is there is so much more that we could talk about about Eve. Like I say, there are many more paintings. There are many more. Uh, there are many other poems. 
Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, Linda next week um, talking about Hagar. And then when we talk about Mary, well, there's a, there's a lot to be done, but the poems that I really love about Mary deal with the Annunciation. And Linda's already seen some of the artwork that I like about the Annunciation. And they're just some great pieces that, that I think are gonna be a little different for you. Um, at least they were when I first saw them. And um, I just love them. And then we'll see what we do from there. Um, so, Joe, could you put yeah. us back on full screen so that we can see everybody? Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. That's perfect. That, that would be great. Yes, there you go. Cool. All right. Excellent. Now, oh, then there's Angie. Hey. Okay. It's great. It's great. Um, so, Michael, do you want to um, invite people again to... Unmuted, unmuted though. I do want to thank everyone for coming this evening to this inaugural effort. And um, I think that we were all just really lifted up by this. Uh, the, the combination of the artwork and the poetry was rather astounding. Although Linda, I must agree with you that when we got into that very first line of the very first poem, the thought that went through my mind is we are not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> It's true. Uh, it's true. And so, well, we're very uh, thankful for the opportunity to uh, join you in this. This is a very great and special privilege for us in uh, in Canada. We're from a parish that Linda served in, um, All Saints Westboro, most of us, and um, we're very happy to be part of your learning expedition. That's been one of the great gifts of this uh, pandemic has been Zoom. Absolutely. And, um, and as you said, learning to be content, Patricia is not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> if I could only get my hair cut, I'd be I know. Oh, don't oh, even go did. there. I'm, I'm gonna, not... I'm gonna be no video next week. <laughs> gonna, I know, I'm gonna put a hat on my head. <laughs> Either that or get the garden shears, but that's another thing. I just wanna say thank you for um, your choice of uh, the art, both poem and, and uh, the visual art because it really did did give two sides of the story yeah and it, it really like i was getting kind of upset there at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> that was the bible part i mean really <laughs> but uh i've calmed down now quite a bit but it, it, it really it's really opened it, it's really opened my eyes because i i haven't thought that much about eve tell you the truth other than what she did yeah one yeah. of the interesting things is that my point of query about eve as a little girl was that in jamaica we would get at christmas these red apples wrapped in some purple paper oh, yeah. were the nastiest things i had <laughs> <laughs> and i thought <laughs> No one would be tempted by an apple there <laughs> with this story. And I've always thought so. Yeah, oh, that's cute. That's a great story. A mango or a peach. Oh, yeah. Well, and sometimes and going some... crunch. Uh uh. Something's not right here. So I'm sure Joe, Joe saw it in some of the paintings it's a pomegranate, it's not an apple. Yeah. That is true. Um, so, uh, because it's got seeds and, you know, Whatever the seeds. Maybe of... it wasn't a Jamaican apple, sorry. <laughs> it's true. So um, we really should go. Uh, <laughs> blessing, blessings on all your heads uh, during this week. Um, I think one of the things that you'll find as we go along is that there, are, there's a thread through all of these stories. Um, so by the time we get to the Hebrew women, they're, ye they're really yelling at Paul about what he said about Eve. So that's kind of funny. And, um, and Hagar too, um, cast out and so on. So I'm sure that you'll all be making the connections um, more so than, than we have in our preparation, but it's, it's been fun and we're really glad to see all of you. So um, see you next week. And I'm grateful to, um, there was a schedule, a lecture scheduled in Ottawa 
next Thursday evening and Simone graciously changed her date so that um, um, I just tell people from Florida, she, my uh, colleague is doing a discussion on my octopus teacher, which is a really remarkable documentary that won a, yes. a, um, an Academy Award this year. I don't know, it's a really wonderful film. So that's next Tuesday night in case you're still bored. Um, you can, you could do two classes next week. Otherwise, yeah, we'll, see you, we'll see you um, next Thursday with Hagar. Let us know about the, the, the Tuesday class too. Okay, I'll send it along. Okay. Everybody's yeah. welcome. Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 See ya. Bye. Thanks Bye all. now. Bye, Bye now. Bye.